The Mercy Seat is the title of our message taken from Exodus chapter 25 and verses 17 to 22. We began last week with the study of the Ark of the Covenant in which God gave to Moses the blueprint to construct the most sacred piece of furniture that is in the house of God. God instructed Moses to build the house of God so that God may dwell in a visible way with his people. And as we study the book of Exodus, does it not warm our hearts to help us to understand indeed that our God does, does draw nigh to us as we draw nigh to him. The tabernacle was the focal point of Israel's community and life. God instructed that Israel would build the tabernacle, God's house. It was the place of worship at the tabernacle was the very presence of God with his people. When they looked inward in their encampment around the tabernacle, there is God with them by a pillar of cloud by day and by a pillar of fire by night. You know, in the book of Acts, the, the, the word of God says that <clears throat> the Exodus was a description of the church in the wilderness. The church in the wilderness. And isn't it so true that we learn from the Word of God that we are on this pilgrim journey on earth. That this world is not our home. And God wants us to know and learn and so he specifically instructed his people to build the tabernacle so that they would, he would come and rest with them. And today, where is the presence of God? Where is the tabernacle of God? Well, the word of God tells us that we are the tabernacle of God. This body of ours is the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is the temple of God. And together as a body of His people, well, we form the church of God. And when the people of God are gathered together, therein is the presence of God with us through His Holy Spirit. And so God gives to us in very feeble forms right at the beginning to help His people to know His presence with us. So today, do we need to see the pillar of fire and the cloud before we understand of the presence of God with us? No, we don't need that. God's Word tells us that the Spirit of God indwells us and is with His people. But God provides us this feeble uh, picture as we learn more and more to trust Him, to follow Him, even without seeing. And yet God is gracious to bring Himself to us so that we can know of Him. And how does Israel uh, see and know the presence of God. Well, let's take a peep at right at the end of this book, chapter 40, and right at the last verse of this book, in Exodus chapter 40 and verse 38. Chapter 40 and verse 38. It says here, For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. The cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day 
and the fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. Everyone in Israel could see the presence of God with them. They were in the wilderness. It was hard in the wilderness. There was nothing in the wilderness, nothing to look, look to for sustenance, for help. And yet, God was there with them, a very visible picture to help us to see how God is with us too. So when Israel looked out of their encampment, it was the stark wilderness. There was darkness out there, death, danger, a very desert place in the wilderness. Israel was to experience the ever-present day-to-day, moment-by-moment care of God for them. Do you know that God is with us? That He's caring for you day by day, moment by moment? Well, as you study the account of the Exodus, the construction of God's house, the Lord wants us to know and let it be real in our hearts. God instructed Israel to establish worship in the wilderness by the building of the tabernacle. We saw in verse 8 and 9 of Exodus 25 the intent, the purpose for the building of the tabernacle and let them make me a sanctuary, a dwelling place that I may dwell among them. Oh, God dwelling with us. The God of heaven dwelling among men. Can we understand that? Well, God, seek that we may understand. According to all that I have showed thee, after the patterns of the tabernacle and the patterns of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. How to build the house of God? Well, this is the example that is given to us. The first building of God's house. And what did God do? Well, God provided everything for the building of His house. In verse 1 and 2, we were told that the children of Israel are to bring an offering. Every man that giveth it willingly with his heart ye shall take my offering. The people of God were to offer to God. And you recall how they came out of Egypt? They were slaves. For many years they were slaves. They had nothing. They were in hard bondage. They were in trouble. And yet when they left Egypt, God instructed them to spoil the Egyptians. Go and learn from the Egyptians. And so God provided for them everything that they needed on their journey. Are you going on a journey? We are all on a journey in this life. Do you know that God provides for our journey? God wants you to know that He provides for your journey. For you to give to Him. Whatever that you give to Him. You know that the Lord has given it so wondrously, so generously to us so that we may acknowledge all that is from Him and come in grateful thanksgiving, in worship. And that's the purpose that God instructed His people to be assembled on the Lord's day, to come before Him, to remember Him, to remember His goodness, And as we think about it, uh, God uh, instructed that Israel would build the first piece of the furniture, that God would want them to construct. And this is called the Ark of the Covenant, which we learned last week. It, It was to be placed in the most holy place 
It is the most sacred furniture and therein will lie, will be a picture of the throne of God in heaven. We haven't been to heaven. What is the throne of God like? The Lord shows it to us and He seeks that this first furniture be constructed. The ark was symbolic of God's throne and presence with His people. And we saw last week the construction of the ark. But we had little time to speak concerning the mercy seat which was a part of the construction, the lid that covers the ark. is called the mercy seat. And the Lord wants us to learn and know what is this mercy seat. The word there simply means a cover, a cover, and is distinct from the ark. And what is the significance of this cover over the ark? Well, the word there had the signification is this, that it is to cover sin in the sense of forgiving sin. So the mercy seat is the place where God shows Himself merciful in forgiving sin. So this is the mercy seat. The mercy seat. This is the place where we would come to God to find forgiveness for our sins. And the priest, the high priest, would go to the most sacred place, the Holy of Holies. There are two rooms in the tabernacle. The holy place and the most holy place. The most holy place is where the throne of God is. And there is the mercy seat. This is the place whereby the priest, the high priest would enter once a year and he would sprinkle the blood of the animal that was killed as a way by which to show us that sins are cleansed, washed in this way. So the priest will sprinkle the blood for the, his own sins and for the sins of his people. Once a year he would enter into the most holy place and there God will meet with his people. Last uh, Lord's Day we saw the three articles that were inside the Ark of the Covenant, the manner of golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the Covenant. The Lord wants us to see right, that indeed He judges us by His laws, but it was the mercy of God that enables sinners who transgress the laws of God to find forgiveness for their sins. And the Lord showed us the construction of this mercy seed, this basic lead that would be covered, the cover of the ark. It will be on top of the ark. And our text uh, tells us in verse uh, 17 of Exodus 25, And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cupids and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cupid and a half shall be the breadth Thereof is exactly the same measurement as 
the ark so it would fit nicely as the the cover over the ark and the lord wants us to understand and learn and and know the significance of this covering and the word there to cover uh, uh, is the verb to the to cover for sins that's the meaning of that word there uh, that is used uh, the mercy seat right and here uh, the word uh, has that meaning of a ransom of a ransom right? and you will learn this in job chapter 33 and verse 24 that's the word there if you turn with me to job chapter 33 and verse 24 Then he is gracious unto him that saith deliver him from going down to the pit I have found a ransom I have found a cover I have found a way a means by which sins can be atoned for a ransom a covering ah here is given to us the way by which our sins can be dealt with right it is through the blood of the lamb that was sprinkled on the mercy seat this was the ransom this was the the cover that is needed to reconcile us to make atonement that's the meaning of the word there for our sins and the lord shows us through that visible picture well we shall study more of it uh, when we are given the blueprint for the what the priest is to do when he makes that atonement but for now the lord wants us to understand the purpose of this mercy seat it was a place whereby the sins of men is dealt with right? where god's wrath is satisfied when the sacrificial blood was sprinkled on it once a year the blood of sacrifice that would be sprinkled on the mercy seat would be a picture of the atonement made for the impurities of our sins so that the anger of god will be averted so there at the throne of god is the mercy seat the place by which our sins can be forgiven and the priest will enter beyond the veil with the blood of atonement bowed in the presence of god and there the throne of judgment the judgment of god at that throne would be transformed into a throne of grace he would meet with moses there between two cherubims ah it's interesting verse 18 of our text says that above the leads are two cherubims what are these cherubims so we're going to talk about a little bit about this uh today uh exodus chapter 25 and verse 18 is the description there verse 18 says and thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of bitten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat and make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two 
ends thereof. So two cherubims, two angels, a picture of the angelic host. Right? Two of them uh, are to be constructed on both sides, both ends of the leads of the ark. And the cherubims should stretch forth their wings on high, verse 20, covering the mercy seat with their wings and their faces looking upon one another. They look one to another and towards the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And the mercy seat will be placed above the ark. And there God will meet with his people. Well, the cherubims are a class of angels to whom God has assigned the privilege of protecting His holiness from intruders. The cherubims is a picture to help us to see that they are the guardians of God's throne. We can't intrude into God's throne, throne room. But these angels are there to guard, to protect. And it's interesting that Satan in Ezekiel 28 was described as the anointed cherub. In other words, he was the prince, the angel that was guarding the holy place of God. Turn with me to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. The Word of God says, here in verse 14 verse 13 describing the anointed cherub Satan before it's for it says here thou has been in Eden the garden of God Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle and gold, the workmanship of thy tablet and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Oh, it's a most beautiful angel and it has pipes. It brings off beautiful sounds. This is Satan, Lucifer. This is the anointed cherub. Verse 14 says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so, so thou was upon the holy mountain of God. What was, what was the, holy, the anointed cherub doing in the holy mountain of God? Well, he is there well, to protect from the intruders to the holiness of God, to the throne room of God. And understanding this, our, word, our text tells us, Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. So before Satan fell, he was the anointed cherub guarding the throne of God. And it's interesting that you see in Exodus 26 uh, verse 1, God will give the blueprint to the building of the 
construction of the weaving of the curtains. They are full of cherubims. It is to help us to see that in heaven, there will be the angelic beings that God created to protect or to as be given God's authority to uh, there to protect those who would desecrate his, his uh, uh, tabernacle. And it's interesting that later on in the history of uh, the Exodus, you would see the two older sons of Aaron who were drunk and they offered strange fires to God and how fire came out of the Holy of Holies to consume them and they were struck dead. And Psalm 104 verse 4, Psalm 104 verse 4 describes for us indeed that the, the cherubs were given that power as God's, the guardians of God's holiness. So anyone who comes and intrudes, well, he strikes. Psalm 104 verse 4 says here, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. A flaming fire. Cherubims were tasked by God to guard the tree of life with flaming swords so that no one could intrude into the garden of Eden after the fall of Adam and Eve. You turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 to help us to see and understand the sacredness of uh, the throne of God, why these angels are constructed uh, um, to help us to know uh, that, uh, that these angels are there uh, to, um, with the authority of God uh, to uh, do the good will of God. And you turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24. The word of God says, And so he drove the men and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of life the cherubims with the flaming sword to guard the way of life. Well, uh, the late Dr. John Wickham puts it well. He says, this is the first instance of law enforcement in the history of the world. Fallen men can never enter the Garden of Eden again. It was paradise lost. And in the construction of the tabernacle, and later when the temple was built, when they entered the promised land, the veil separated, that separated the holy place from the most holy place were constructed. With, to help us to see right, a separation between us and God. And when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was rent from the top to the bottom. Matthew 27 and verse 51 tells us to show us that the way by which by which Men could not come before the presence of God uh, is being cleared 
by the broken body of Christ and by His spilled blood so that men can once again enter into paradise, enter into the very presence of God. So the construction of this uh, mercy seat and the cherubims is to help us to see indeed that this is the throne of God and this is heaven itself. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul was taken up to heaven and he showed us 2 Corinthians chapter 12 what God had done through Jesus Christ on our behalf. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1, It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew of a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. And such one was caught up to the third heaven. Paul was describing himself being caught up to the throne of God, the third heaven. What is the third heaven? Well, our sky is the first heaven. The outer space is the second heaven. The third heaven is the place of the abode of God. It's where the presence of God is. And Paul says that he was caught up to the third heaven. And he says that I knew of such a man, whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell, but God knoweth how that he was caught up into the paradise. Paradise! He was caught up into paradise, heaven itself. So the construction of the tabernacle, the, the Ark of the Covenant was a picture for us to see the very throne room of God. And he heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. And such of such one will I glory, he says. He speaks of what he saw, how the Lord brought him to see, to re-enter, as it were, into paradise through the blood of Christ. Ah, so that we, when we would take our last breath, when we would die, God brings us to his very presence to the presence of God. The spirit of the man, the soul, would enter directly to heaven when we die. If we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, if our sins have been forgiven. And so, here, the Lord wants us to see and understand the purpose of the, the mercy seat. I, the cherubims would guard it so that sinful men cannot enter. But through the blood, through the shed blood of the animal, a picture of Christ, the Christ that will come, men could come to the very presence of God. What a comfort it is to have a blood bought mercy seat as the hymn uh, writer Hugh Stowell wrote a retreat from the stormy winds of the world that blow against the Christian's walk he wrote this in 1828 this will be our closing hymn and caught in the vision of the believer's privilege that we can come to the very presence of God before the mercy seat to find comfort in times of need. We thank God that we can come before the presence of God because of what Christ had done on our behalf. 
and our uh, text tells us in Hebrews chapter 4. Would you turn there as we close? Hebrews chapter 4. To help us to see what Christ had done for us, that through Him we can enter to the very throne room of God, to the very presence of God. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, like we are, yet without sin. Christ was himself the high priest, and Christ was himself the sacrifice for our sins. He has died for our sins on the cross, shed his blood to wash away our sins. He was one who walked the earth and he was tempted at all points, yet without sin. Dear friends, are you tempted in any way? Well, the Lord says to us that in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, we would find a way out of every temptation. So are you tempted? Well, what is the purpose of a temptation? Well, it is to trip us from doing the will of God, to draw us away from the blessed walk with God. And so how can we find help? Verse 16 of our text says, In every temptation, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So for the believer today, we don't need to go to the temple of God, don't need to see the tabernacle, but we are the temple of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we can come to God directly, to His throne, to speak to Him, to find help through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. He is the mercy seat. He is the one to pay the price for the atonement of our sins. And we can come to Him to find help in times of need. So the hymn writer says, From every stormy wind that blows, from every swelling tide of woes, there is a calm and sure retreat, this found beneath the mercy seat. When you would come to God in prayer, when you utter your prayer to God in the name of Jesus Christ. Your prayers reach all the way through the veil to the very throne of God. There at the throne of God, God reigns supreme. Is there anything that He cannot do to help you? There is nothing He could not do to help His people. And his people uh, have that privilege to come before him. And I pray that the people of God would fully understand this privilege of prayer. And we have been organizing, encouraging the people of God to come together to pray our Wednesday prayer meeting where we would call upon God for the many needs of God's people. Many needs, many infirmities. 
And we have that privilege to intercede on behalf of someone, to call on God for His mercy upon the people around us. Sometimes it's not for ourselves, but for someone we love, someone we know, and sometimes for people we don't know. We have been praying for the people in Ukraine, in Russia. God hears our prayer that we can be an instrument that God would use for the comfort of those who are ailing, those who are in trouble. That's the privilege that we have as a people of God. That's the privilege that we have to come before God at His mercy seat through the veil because of what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Strengthen us as we understand indeed that there is a place whereby we can find mercy and help in times of need. Lord, strengthen thy people that we would indeed shut ourselves, hide ourselves in thee uh, in a world that is going amok. Lord, there is a place of sure retreat. Lord, strengthen thy people and comfort us as we uh, look to thee. May thou be gracious to meet all our needs for thy own honour and glory. This we pray with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.